7.03. The chair knows the time is 7.03. I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As ZBA chair, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. We'll begin with a roll call of ZBA members. Steve Judge is present. Mr. Craig Meadows. Here. Mr. Philip White. Here. Mr. Everald Henry. Here. Miss Mr. David Sloviter. Here. Ms. Sarah Marshall. Here. And Ms. Hilda Greenball. Here. The quorum is present. Uh, also attending this public hearing is Christine Brestrup, planning director, and Rob Wachilla, planning planner for the town. In addition, we have two representatives from KP Law, Carolyn Murray and Jonathan Murray, to provide the presentation tonight. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties of interest. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and recorded by town staff. Uh, tonight's agenda. Uh, before we do that, there, I don't think there's any disclosures needed, but does anybody wish to make a disclosure of any type? All right, tonight's agenda. It's a public meeting on administrative matters. Chapter 40B training, KP Law will conduct a training on the comprehensive permitting process known as Chapter 40B process with the full ZBA membership. After that, a general public comment period on matters not before the board tonight, um, other business not anticipated within the last 48 hours, and adjournment. So, um, Mr. Murray, I guess you're the first one here, and uh, unless anybody else has anything specifically to say about 40B, any members? If not, let's get started with our briefing. We appreciate um, you're doing this. I've been through a 40B. It's a different process than we use normally for all of our, um, our special permitting or our, our variances. Um, it's, a, it's a special process that's laid out in state law, one we need to follow that's different than other, other processes we use, and it's a little complicated. So I really appreciate the fact that all the members um, who are not as familiar with this have taken the time today to be at this briefing. And the good news is, we will have the help of the KP law firm during the process as we go through on chapter 40B, which will be, which I have found to be most helpful. So with that, Mr. Murray, take it away. Thank you. Well, thank you for having us. And oh, uh, we also have Carol, I see that Carolyn Murray is, always, is also signed in. So we got a full house, that's great. Yes, thank you. And um, I know Carolyn was just having a moment of technical difficulties and I, she's going to lead this discussion, but i um, not sure if she can hear us or see us quite yet, but while she's getting up and running, um, just thank you for having us. I know that this topic uh, can sometimes be a daunting one, as you said, uh, but we hope that the training is helpful. And I, I find uh, perhaps uh, just before we get started, uh, and I, I know that everyone's background in this might might vary, but is there anything in particular, I think it's valuable to ask, is there anything in particular or any specific questions you'd like us to focus on as we go through our discussion? I just want to make sure that any specific questions you might have um, are answered. So is there any anything you'd like us to focus on or any anything like that? Um. Ms. Greenbaum, you have your hand up. Yes, I'm particularly interested in local preference and largely because I read the Globe every day and uh, currently the lawsuit that's pending in the eastern part of the state. We have gone way over our required 10% and I'm feeling that 
is there a way that we can push the local preference up to 100% on the owner occupied condos that might be built? That's my issue. I really feel that we're doing more than our job in supplying affordable housing and there's not enough for the people who live here and work here to find a place to live that they can afford. So I, I'm really interested in pursuing the road of trying to get 100% of um, local preference. If you have anything to say about that with the, what is it, Holden lawsuit I'm reading about today. So if you've got anything to say about that, I'd love to hear it. All right, that'd be really good to put in the, if that's a complete, that's an uh, integral part of what we have to deal with. So make sure that's, make sure that's in the presentation. Because I, I think trying to explain it right now for people who aren't familiar with it could take, could be confusing. But that's a really good question, Ms. Greenbaum. It's one that came up the last time we did a 40B. So it's an appropriate question. Absolutely. We'll touch upon that and um, all the various aspects of safe harbor and local preference. And so we'll, we'll, we'll touch upon that in the presentation. Uh, anything else I, I should note or Carolyn should note just before we get started here? Chris. Restro. So I just wanted to mention that um, the two um, 40B projects that will be coming before you are considered to be by people who work for the town, at least, and I think also by the town council to be, um, you know, friendly 40Bs. They're not threatening 40Bs. So I just wanted to make that clear at the outset. I think you know that already, but I just wanted to make that statement. Thank you. And Chris, just while we're getting started here. Uh, just re quickly review the two projects. I know one is a ball house and what's the name of the other one? But just give us, the, yeah. I don't know. Well, one one is on Ball Lane and it's um, 30 units of home ownership. And um, <clears throat> it's at, actually at the intersection of Pulpit Hill Road and Route 63. Uh, it's a property that was used as a trucking company. And I think there was also some farming that went on there. Um, so um, Valley Community Development Corporation is proposing 30 units in 15 duplexes on that property, um, and it's going to be for home ownership. The other project is actually has two parts. The other project is a, a project that we're working on with Wayfinders, and um, the two parcels of land are being um, either leased or sold to Wayfinders. I'm not clear about, or to the yeah, to Wayfinders by the town. They're, they have been owned by the town. One is a property on Belchertown Road that the town purchased a few years ago um, with CPA funds. And um, we are making that available to Wayfinders to build uh, affordable housing and also market rate housing on that property. And then we also have the East Street School, which is on East Street. It's an old school that was um, used by the town for se several years until I think my daughter was in fourth grade there actually. But um, in any event, um, it's, a, it's a beautiful old building and um, that building is also um, part of the project that we're working on with Wayfinders. And I forget how many units are proposed there, but they're going to be using the existing school building as well as building some new um, units out in front. So. Uh, that's one project, really, the Belchertown Road East Street School pr project, we consider it one project, and then the Ball Lane project is another one. Ball Lane is moving ahead more quickly, so we'll probably get an application for that um, within the next month, if not within the next few weeks. And the other one is probably not going to come in for a while, but those are the two projects that we've been uh, working on. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Okay, are there any other questions or highlights, the things you want the highlighted in the presentation? If not, it looks like you've got your uh, technical difficulties, you surmounted your technical difficulties and you're coming to us from San Francisco, it looks like. I, <laughs> I, 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 I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I apologize at this point, I guess I would say my, my thanks to Jonathan for being willing to uh, to pitch it on short notice. I, I was out west today, but only in Sturbridge. Uh, <laughs> but uh, getting back here for some reason, I don't know, one of my devices is not uh, allowing me to have video this evening. So I have gone to 
device number two, which then puts up the San Francisco bridge. But I can assure you, I am not in San Francisco. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. but my my apologies. So I know, Rob, I know you have a copy of the, the PowerPoint presentation. Um, since I am not able to pull that up and share that, are, are you able to, or do the board members um, have a copy at least to follow along? So I can um, pull up that presentation on the screen as well, Carolyn, if it'll help with your, okay. your direction, but you just have to give me one second. No problem, it. sorry. No worries. And it won't be in a PowerPoint form. It's going to be a PDF that I'm going to scroll through. I don't know if that's going to matter to you or not. Um, no, it, it won't matter from my end, but thank you. Yep. All right. So I have it up and I will screen share right now. Can everybody see that? Oh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, so just by you know a uh, way of introduction, obviously, um, Carolyn Murray from KP Law. Um, I've worked with uh, some of your staff folks before, but I don't think I've had the pleasure of meeting with the zoning board. Um, and I recognize that some of you may actually have been through the 40B process before. Some of you, this may be uh, new to you. Um, I typically like to run these uh, these trainings as, as being as interactive as possible. So if you have questions, please feel free to interrupt because I think that becomes the most uh, you know, meaningful way to, uh, to absorb some of the information. So I will certainly address the question on local preference um, later on in the, in the uh, presentation where I think it makes a little bit of sense, but certainly if there are other things that pop up, feel free to ask. So with that, Rob, I think we can just go to the introductory page, please. So our, our disclaimer, um, since this is a training and since you have a couple of applications that will be coming before you, you know, the purpose tonight is not to discuss any specific project. Um, so uh, especially since because you are supposed to be making your decisions based on information that is provided to the board at your um, you know, at in the at your public hearings. So uh, the disclaimer is really just to say if you want to talk about projects that have either already been before you or even projects that uh, might be coming before you, let's keep them in the hypothetical and not necessarily give them a particular name and, and uh, identify them so that that way we aren't running afoul of um, basing your decisions on information that comes up during your public hearings. So just for those of you who might be new to chapter 40B or haven't been through the public hearing process before, um, it gets its name from the chapter, uh, chapter 40B, and really it's just a very short chapter, sections 20 to 23, but the key element to this is that it allows a developer to obtain a single comprehensive permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals um, for a residential development that does include um, a certain percentage of affordable housing. What is a little bit unique in this um, particular scheme is that the ZBA, by, by, the, by the use of the term comprehensive permit, the ZBA is supposed to act in place of all other local boards with respect to any sort of local bylaw, rule, or regulation. So ordinarily, where the ZBA might have a variance before you or maybe a special permit, and there might also be some relief that uh, that project might require, say, from the Conservation Commission or the Historical Commission. In the context of a 40B, you as the ZBA are acting in place of all of those other local boards and issuing the same permits that those other local boards would issue. 
The only exception is when those local boards are operating under some sort of state regulatory scheme. So for example, with the Board of Health and um, Title V regulations, if, um, if the applicant is seeking some kind of a waiver under a state requirement, they're still going to have to go to the Board of Health for that. But if an applicant is seeking some relief from a local Board of Health requirement, they're gonna, that's all gonna be granted through you, the ZBA. Same thing with uh, the Conservation Commission. If the Conservation Commission um, is administering the State Wetlands Protection Act, they have to still go to the Conservation Commission. But if there is some local requirement, a local wetlands bylaw that uh, perhaps is more restrictive than the state, any relief that they're seeking from that, they are going to come, uh, that's going to come up in the context of the comprehensive permit. And the Zoning Board of Appeals is going to decide and issue permits accordingly. That can be a little unnerving for zoning boards because um, you're not typically boards of health looking at septic matters. You're not typically conservation commissions, you know, looking at um, wetlands matters. So uh, that, it, that isn't to say that you can't still rely upon the technical expertise of your staff. It's just that your decision will address those other um, aspects besides just uh, the typical zoning matters. Um, as you're probably all well aware, um, comprehensive permit also allows a developer to override all local zoning or local bylaws or local rules or regulations in the form of waivers that the zoning board is granted, uh, is authorized to grant. Um, and the key that what we normally see in these 40Bs is because there is an affordable component to them, typically at least 25% uh, of the units have to be kept affordable, um, to make up for the developer's loss of profit, shall we say, um, typically what you see then in a 40B is a project that comes in at a greater density than might be allowed by zoning. So sometimes for the first time, a zoning board might look at a 40B project and say, well, they're putting residential multifamily in a zoning district where um, you know it's a commercial zoning district. We don't allow any residential uses there. Doesn't matter. You can completely override zoning in terms of the use perspective, but also in terms of any kind of a, a density or dimensional component that uh, the bylaw might also have. So I think we can move to the next page. So if we start at the beginning of the process um, where we are now, one of the things that we always suggest that folks do before an application comes in is actually to start planning for this comprehensive permit, much like you're doing tonight. Um, one of the things is whether or not we have to look at any kind of comprehensive planning um, that either we need to do now or that has already happened that might actually apply to um, a particular site as it comes uh, as an application comes forward. You should also look into, you know, do we have an affordable housing production plan? Has it been certified? Have we met our goals um, if it has been certified? Are there any requirements in our master plan or our open space plan that we want to look at and make sure that um, you know these things are up to date or they're incorporated and thought about in the 40B process. But perhaps, if we can go to the next page, perhaps the most important thing that the zoning board can do before uh, a comprehensive permit application is received is look at your own regulations on 40Bs. Um, you know, once the application comes in, whatever your regu regulations are as of the date that those that, that application is filed, we are locked in to our regulations. So um, for example, if you haven't had um, a 40B in some time, or if you haven't looked at your um, application requirements or your filing fees or anything like that in some time, it's too late once the application comes in. You know, now would be the time to consider those things or see if there's anything that really should be updated. Um, 
the other thing that uh, we should always make sure, and I'm sure that this is uh, something that you folks regularly follow anyway, is uh, making sure that you've got provisions in place in your regulations for requiring consultants to pay um, fees for any peer review that you might actually need um, and make sure that the process for the selection of a peer review consultant is also um, you know, built into your regulations. So let's start at what you know, the 40B really is all about. And um, I wanna introduce a, a standard which is this concept of consistent with local needs. You know, like every, every application that comes before the board, there's always some sort of standard to, to apply. You know, if we were talking about a variance, we'd be looking at shape, soil, and topography, and we'd be looking at a, a hardship. Here in the 40B world, the standard is whether or not the project is consistent with local needs or whether our denial might be consistent with local needs or our application of any of our local bylaws or regulations, are they consistent with local needs? Um, it's kind of a term of art, uh, but and, and it's a little bit uh, complicated in terms of its subparts, but one of the things that um, it goes into this idea of whether or not a, a ZBA's decision happens to be consistent with local needs has to do with the statutory minima, which is what the regulations refer to, but more colloquially, this is what we call safe harbors. Um, if the town is in a safe harbor, and for example, you are at more than 10% for your subsidized housing inventory. So the Zoning Board of Appeals could, with respect to any of these other applications that may be filed, the board could invoke safe harbor. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that process means. Um, but essentially, if you decided to invoke Safe Harbor, you could still go ahead and entertain the comprehensive permit. Or you could deny the comprehensive permit on the basis that you have met a Safe Harbor. And what that essentially means is that if we truly are in a Safe Harbor situation, then the board's denial of a comprehensive permit or our approval of a comprehensive permit with conditions is deemed to be consistent with local needs. It also means that the applicant has no right of appeal. And that's really the important thing because these cases can wind up you know, in litigation for years, um, but you, you do have a little bit more leverage when you're in a safe harbor situation such as you are with having met the 10%. Um, this is always balanced, obviously, against the regional need for um, low and moderate income housing. Um, but um, again, if you've met a safe harbor and it's uh, not disputed, then your decision is going to be deemed consistent with local needs. So if we could go to the next page. Yeah, we also have a question from one of our members. Everold has his sure. hand, please. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Um, <clears throat> Attorney Murray, I, I think one of the things that um, I, I heard earlier is, you know, with a comprehensive permit, um, we could prove something, um, and don't quote me on this, I'm just going to try to make sure I got it right, in a commercial zoned area for something that is non-commercial. Um, the question is, if we do that, are we now not setting a precedent where someone can come before the ZBA to get a permit cited in this as a rationale to get a permit for something that is not zoned for where they're trying to get the permit? Only if it is another 40B project. So this is something that is unique to comprehensive permits in that the chap the, the statute literally allows um, through the ZBA, it allows you to override all local zoning if you wanted to. So that multifamily apartment building or, or duplexes or whatever the configuration might be for affordable housing, it can go in a zoning district where residential uses may not be allowed or multifamily uses may not be allowed. 
because of the fact that it is a 40B project. If another developer came in um, with a purely market rate um, apartment building or some other type of you know, multifamily residential development, but it was all market rate, no affordable units, and they were just applying say under, I don't know what they would apply for under if they're not coming in under 40B, but let's suppose they tried to make an argument it does not set a precedent for you now for other uses. It would have to be another 40B um, that allows for the override of local zoning. Okay, and because one of the, um, I, I think one of the conditions um, that one of the findings that we have to make in certain situations is that the project and complements what is already there. Um, but again, these 40Bs are um, just what they are. There is no um, precedent is what you're saying to just allow anything else, even if it complements said this new project. Mm -hmm. Right, so I think um, what you're, suggesting is like lots of times the zoning bylaw will have a provision that you know the the proposed project is in keeping with the character or harmonious with other uses in the neighborhood that type of thing um i i don't mean to minimize when i say that 40b allows you to override every aspect of zoning if if necessary um so the questions of uh, you know, in some of the earlier cases, the question of, well, um, you know, if we allow multifamily residential use in a zoning district where that's not a use allowed and our zoning bylaw doesn't allow us to grant use variances, aren't you telling us essentially that what we would need to do is grant a use variance? It's one way of thinking of it, but it, it isn't called a use variance, it's called a waiver. So the developer is supposed to, when they come in, identify every, ask, every provision of your zoning bylaws or even your general bylaws that they feel that they cannot comply with. And it's up to the zoning board to decide whether or not they wanna grant waivers from all of those provisions. And, and I will be honest, they are typically very long lists, not always, but sometimes they can be pages and pages long where you feel as though we're not even worried about whether or not this project is in keeping with the character of the neighborhood or harmonious with other uses in the surrounding area. That, that just goes out the window. It really comes down to this idea that we have to look, we have to recognize that the state has said that there is a housing crisis and there is also um, coupled with that a need for low and moderate income housing and every city and town has to do their part to try to accommodate some affordable housing and if that means that zoning has to yield a little bit then so be it and so this is this is what the the legislature has come up with through the whole 40b process so miss murray just to put a final point on it for us in amherst we in our zoning bylaw, section 10.38 is what we normally focus on. It's a long list of things that generally speak to having to find that the, it's, it's very general, I mean, I'm oversimplifying it here, but have to find that the application is not detrimental to the, the uh, neighborhood or to the town, right? And it's consistent with, the, with our plan. In effect, we don't have to make that finding. Those findings, what we normally do we do not have to do under a 40B. Correct. Got it. Correct. That's why I started with the standard okay. of consistent with local needs. You know, we will be looking at um, whether or not we think this project with whatever conditions and waivers the board feels are appropriate is consistent with local needs. Got it. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Was you're, there another? You're, you're muted, Hilda. Hilda, oh, oh. can you waive some of the waivers that they ask for and not others as long as it's still 
um, economically viable. In other words, if they want to go within, say, the 50 foot setback of a wetland and the CONCOM says no, can we overrule that? You can. And, and to your point, you don't have to take every waiver that a developer presents. It's not a slate that you vote up or down. Um, there might be some waivers that you think are um, appropriate given the site or given the size of the project or given its location. And then there might be others that you look at and say, no, we really, we, we don't wanna make a concession on this. We think that you know either the developer can be made to comply with that provision, or maybe the developer can tweak the project a little bit in a way that um, that does comply with the bylaw. But you're absolutely right that if we, you know, if there is this other concept in the 40B about rendering a project uneconomic, you know, that it, whether it's you know whether it's a condition we impose or whether it is a refusal to grant a waiver, if the only way that the developer can then comply with that condition or satisfy the zoning bylaw would um, you know, render the project uneconomic, well, the developer has to raise that with the board. And that starts a whole, uh, almost like a side process, if you will, because the question becomes, you know, is there is there a way that the the developer could you know adequately mitigate whatever that condition is or whatever that zoning bylaw provision is that might satisfy the zoning board? If the developer can't properly mitigate it, or the mitigation would be so cost prohibitive that it renders the project uneconomic. The developer can, has to assert that. And now we start this separate process of if the Zoning Board of Appeals doesn't want to budge off of its position, now we're actually looking at the financial aspects of this project. And that would likely mean the Zoning Board of Appeals having to hire or bring in a, a third party consultant to help us you know, go through the pro forma from the developer and really sort of look into the weeds of the numbers and figure out, is there any you know, basis for them to truly say that this would render the project uneconomic? Um, you know, one of the things, this isn't necessarily a, a zoning bylaw provision or a waiver, but usually this comes up in the context of, we feel the project is too big or it's, you know, it's a, it's the massing and the scale and where it is in, in, in relation to other buildings in town, it just feels like, you know, a wart on our, our community's landscape. So we want to push it back a little bit and we want to maybe even reduce the number of units. That's always something that is like the third rail for developers where they will argue, if I can't get all of the number, all of the units that I need, this does not become a viable project for me. Well, you know, that's when we have to decide, do we really want to pursue that and force them to reduce the number of units? And if we do, then we've got to be ready to really talk about the economics of it and see how that, you know, how that plays out. Mr. Meadows. Is the term uneconomic based upon first cost or life cycle cost? It it um it really has to do with I don't think it really gets into life cycle cost. It really looks at you know what are your land acquisition costs. What are your engineering costs to, to design this? What are your construction costs to build it and get it up and occupied? The fact that you might have um, like a monitoring agent that helps get new tenants in there as there's tenant turnover, that typically is not looked at. Um, but there's, you know, there's always this idea of a you know rate of return on investment, and they have to be, you know, they, they can't make 
more money than the subsidizing agency allows them to make on it. But it's, it's typically the, the cost to get the project constructed, not total life cycle. Well, I, I'm thinking in terms of you can very inexpensively build something. And the mechanical systems can be very inexpensive, but the cost to the tenant or to the landlord for the annual costs for, let's say, electricity, uh, gas, oil, can be much higher than if you put in a solar system, ground source heat pumps, uh, variable refrigerant flow systems, heat pumps, a variety of other techniques that will keep your long-term costs down, but may give you a higher first cost. Right. And so where do you come, where, where do you make the distinction as far as affordability is concerned? What I have seen developers do, and, and they more and more are getting open um, to you know, reusable energy and, and sustainability, they are becoming a little more open to those kinds of conversations. But what I've seen um, in some other projects where, you know, they're, they, they weren't designed for that. So they are still um, looking at kind of very conventional mechanical systems for, for heating, ventilation, et cetera. Um, if the board then said, well, we want you to put solar panels on the roof, it's then up to the developer to push back as to why that could not work. And, you know, five, 10 years ago, I think there would have been more pushback than you'd see now, um, and especially with so many of the, the state legislatures incentives and in getting to net zero greenhouse gases, et cetera. Um, you're starting to see more of that being built into designs that are a little bit more forward thinking. So I wouldn't hesitate that if you saw something that still seemed to be, you know, a design that wasn't forward thinking like that, um, bring it up because you do have a valid point about well, yes, it may cost you more in year one or year two when this is under construction, but by the time this building is you know, 15 years old, that technology or, or whatever, that system that we've made you, um, it, it, you know, made you build into this, to your project has more than paid for itself. I think it can become, all become part of the argument of whether or not it is or is not economic. So um, we'll go f finish up, Craig. I'm sorry. Well, I, I just wanted to say, so our town planners would be wise to inform at these initial stages, the developers, that there's a probability that there would be a request for them to do an analysis and determine whether it's going to be viable for them to put in uh, systems that are going to be beneficial long term. Correct? Yes. Okay. So uh, Sarah and David have their hands up. I don't want to get this is an important point. It may not come it, it may not come up, um, but it's an important issue for us. But I don't want to get in the weeds on this and, and we've got a lot to learn about 40B other than just economic viability. And I, I want to make sure that we get through it all tonight before too late. But so Sarah and David, um, ask your questions, but let's then move on to the rest of the presentation and, and not get bogged down in economic viability. Okay, I, I think this, I think I know the answer to this question, but I want to check. Uh, we cannot relax the building code in any way. Is that right? Correct, because that comes from the state. So similar right. to Title V or Chapter 131, the Wetlands Protection Act, those are things that come directly, you know, that are that are state mandated, we cannot alter. Mr. Sloboda. 
Is there an implied responsibility on the ZBA to help a developer make a project more affordable? For instance, if a developer comes before the ZBA with a badly thought out uh, proposal, can the ZBA simply de deny it? Or where does, the, where does the ZBA have some sort of role that we are responsible to pursue with the developer? I'm, it, sounds, it sounds like we have an implied responsibility to make the project more affordable. Is that not true? I don't I don't know that I would say that you have a responsibility to make the project more affordable. I you know the the developers when they come in, they've looked at your zoning bylaws and your other requirements um, and they've incorporated you know let's say your sewer connection fees, for example, and water connection fees. you know they've incorporated all of those things into, their, you know, their their pro forma of okay, what what will it cost us to really build this project? Um, if you're asking, you know, does the zoning board really have any kind of affirmative duty to, uh, you know, work with the developer to get to a better design? No, you do not. And and in fact, I often hear from boards, it's not our job to design your project for you. We're just telling you that we don't like where you've put the parking, we don't think you've got enough snow storage space, or we don't think you've provided enough open space, whatever the concerns happen to be. Um, but that, you know, that being said, if you're going to deny it, it has to be based on some kind of local requirement. So you're gonna be looking for something, some bylaw provision or some local regulation um, that rises to the level of a public health or safety concern that the board feels cannot be relaxed and cannot come up with any way for the developer to properly mitigate it. So that I don't think necessarily renders the project more affordable. Like I'm not suggesting that you, know, you, you let the developer get away with the cheapest design possible. Uh, because there are still important things that they've got to comply with that that get built into the cost and that design. Okay, thank you. All right. So going back to safe harbors, um, as you know, as you all know, because you're you exceed the ten percent, you clearly check off that box. So I'm not going to spend too too much time on other safe harbors. But just so that you know, obviously there are other safe harbors, like the 1.5% general land area minimum. Um, if you've had some sort of a large project um, in, in Amherst's case, based on your housing units, 300 units or 2% of your housing units, whichever happens to be greater, if that had been, um, uh, if you had a project of that size before you, you would be able to claim a safe harbor. Um, Related applications. Uh, this is something that uh, let's suppose a developer came in for a conventional subdivision and wanted to put in 25 single family houses. And uh, the planning board said, that's just too much. You know, we think that that's just too high a density. We'd like to see it um, smaller than that. And the developer decides, you know, they're either going to withdraw their subdivision application or the planning board ultimately denies their application. What you sometimes hear developers say is, if you don't like this project, I'll be back with a 40B. And if you think 25 units on a subdivision looked bad, I'll be back with a 40B that'll be twice as many units. When you have a situation like that, where, the, where a related application that also had to do with residential development on the same property, comes back before the board in the form of a 40B um, within tw a 12 month period, um, we, we can within that 12 month claim a safe harbor, it's sort of a cooling off period. In other words, you're not supposed to come in and use the, the 40B as you know, revenge for not being able to get the prior project approved. And then also there's the um, affordable housing production plan. 
um, that's also got a safe harbor. But I want to go into, since you have met the 10%, I want to go ahead to the next slide to just talk about what is the process, you know. So to, as I've already said before, you, uh, you know, safe harbor, if the board asserts it, allows you to deny a comprehensive permit or to grant it with conditions and the decision's final. The applicant has absolutely no recourse. They could decide not to build it, but they don't have any ability to go to the Housing Appeals Committee and um, fight over any provisions in that decision. But just because you're in a safe harbor doesn't mean you can't entertain uh, another 40B project. You know, some communities think that if they hit 10%, a developer can't even file. That's not true. And as you're going to see in Amherst, um, being at a safe harbor doesn't necessarily protect you from anyone filing. It just protects you in terms of how you handle that uh, once it's before you. So if we could go to the next slide on, on the process. Um, so unlike any of your other um, applications that typically come before a zoning board of appeals, a comprehensive permit is also supposed to be a, an expedited permit process. So rather than your usual, say 65 days to open a public hearing, you have 30 days to open the public hearing on a 40B. More importantly, if you're going to assert safe harbor, you have to do that within 15 days of opening the public hearing. So uh, that often puts you know, zoning boards sort of uh, under a lot of pressure because you still have to advertise the public hearing for at least two weeks prior. So by the time you actually open the public hearing, you are essentially like that very night opening the public hearing and asserting your safe harbor. You can then go on and do two things. You can say, uh, we're asserting safe harbor and letting the developer know that because we are in a safe harbor, we could deny this comprehensive permit if we so choose. We also could go ahead and actually hear the merits of the application. But we're putting you developer on notice that again, if we ultimately deny it, or if we approve it with conditions, because we have asserted the safe harbor, you have no right of recourse to appeal it. Now you have to follow that up with a written notice to the developer and I'm, I'm sorry, my, I'm still referring to them as the Department of Housing and Community Development as opposed to the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities. I'll, uh, I'll have to get my mindset wrapped around their new agency name. But that written notice is, has to go out and be received by them within 15 days. The developer has the right to challenge whether or not the town is actually in a safe harbor. Now, typically when you've got, you know, 11 plus percent, uh, you know, on the SHI as being affordable, that's typically not something that a developer is going to challenge because that is a percentage based on documentation that has been submitted to DHCD. Usually you see these safe harbors get challenged in the 1.5% general land area minimum where we all argue over how to calculate it land area. Um, but someone could still appeal um, the safe harbor. And then what happens at that point is there's an immediate appeal to the Housing Appeals Committee that suspends your comprehensive permit proceedings until DHCD and the Housing Appeals Committee ultimately decide, do they agree with the town that you have indeed achieved a safe harbor? If they were to ultimately conclude that you had not achieved a safe harbor, the matter goes right back to the Zoning Board of Appeals for you to pick up where you left off and on the merits of the application itself. Even if they find that you are in a safe harbor, you can still go back if the board so chooses and if the developer chooses, sometimes the developer decides that they don't necessarily wanna take the risk of going forward with, um, a comprehensive permit when a safe harbor has been asserted, but um, you could then go back 
and actually see this through to conclusion to a decision on the comprehensive permit itself. So just for context, what's yes. our what's our affordable housing level? We're well over the 10%. You right. are at We're, like 11.72 when I checked, and that's yeah. assuming that the online SHI is accurate. And that's what that's what we go by. That's the, that's the measure that's used, right? Okay. Yeah. So we've got yeah. some data. Good. All right. Yeah. All right. So let's assume we're actually going forward um, with an application uh, before the board. Oh, Ms. Go ahead, Ms. Marshall. Yeah. Is this oh, sorry. Yeah. So is it um, should in general the ZBA assert safe harbor if it if it does qualify for one in order to preserve the option to deny the permit? Like, is I, it remiss? I, remiss of the board not to do so if if we could i would strongly encourage the board to do it because it isn't just in case this results in a denial it's right. also that even if you approve it with conditions the applicant has no right of appeal and you know in, in from my experience with the housing appeals committee these appeals go on for years so if you can save yourself some legal fees go for it assert that safe harbor. not that we don't love doing work for you all but you know you can all spend that money elsewhere if you just assert the safe harbor but still say but you know what we're going to hear this project on ball street or or where, whichever project is before you first um but you know be on notice that um our decision we're going to make sure it's not appealable yeah it gives us so, it gives us power Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, the project eligibility letter, I just want to talk about this a little bit because we are starting to see some developers file their comprehensive permit applications before a project eligibility letter has been issued. So for those who may not be familiar with what a project eligibility letter is, before an application for a comprehensive permit is filed with the Zoning Board of Appeals. The developer is supposed to take their concept plans to a subsidizing agency. Could be Mass Housing, could be Mass Housing Partnership, could be uh, you know any any of the variety of different um, subsidizing agencies that exist. And the subsidizing agency is then supposed to send a letter to the chief executive officer in the town and invite comments within, you've got a 30 day window uh, during which they wanna hear all of your concerns about traffic, water, sewer, infrastructure, whatever it happens to be. Um, they also wanna come out and conduct a site visit to see whether or not this seems to be an appropriate location for an affordable housing project. If the subsidizing agency believes that this is a viable project and a good location, um, they will issue a project eligibility letter. That to me, for those uh, you know, who remember the Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, the project eligibility letter, that is your golden ticket to proceed. You are not supposed to file with the ZBA until you've got that project eligibility letter in hand. But as I said, there are a couple of developers who are aware that they might be competing with another developer um, and they want to get in before perhaps a safe harbor is met. Uh, so they're applying for with the ZBA before this project eligibility letter has been received. Um, if that should happen, please reach out and let us know so that we can guide you through the right process. Um, because our, our reading of the regulations is that you must have this in place in order to file the 40B application. Um, we have not gotten a court yet to um, you know, necessarily rule on whether or not they can go forward and file the application while the project eligibility letter is still in the works. Um, that may come up, but um, for now, I say we, we hold our ground and we say, no, you have to have this in place. And why is this project eligibility letter important? because it tells us that three criteria 
um, have been satisfied. It tells us that the developer is either a public agency, that they're a nonprofit or a limited dividend organization, or they are willing to form one that would actually be the, the, um, the applicant of the 40B itself. Um, that eligibility letter says the subsidizing agency would be willing to fund this project. And it also looks to whether or not the developer has control of the site. That doesn't necessarily mean they have to own it, it means it could be under a purchase and sale agreement or that there is at least some sort of um, long-term you know, leasing agreement in place. So those that takes you know, three components right off of the Zoning Board of Appeals um, plates if you've got that project eligibility letter. Rob, do you have a question? So it's not really a question, it's more of a, um, just building off of what Carolyn said about the agencies that submit these applications. So there's a lot of agencies that, um, or developers who would already have the funds handy to do a project like this, but then you have other ones such as the nonprofits that rely on grant funding to do these types of projects. And a lot of the times, some of these grant programs that they get their funding from might have deadlines that pressure them into getting these projects through quickly. Um, and other ones don't have any deadlines, so they have more flexibility and time for when they can have these projects um, submitted and they're not as hurried. So the projects that we have come before us in Amherst are, um, luckily, Valley Community Development does not have a deadline for their grant funding. So they're willing to be flexible with the town for any deadlines that might be imposed on them. I just wanted to bring up that point. Hypothetic, of course. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So, Thanks, so, I think, so as I think as we advance to the next page, um, I have covered, if we, thank you, Rob, if we, um, I've covered all of those at items. The only thing I wanted to just also highlight was that the project eligibility letter is not appealable. Um, I will tell you that there are some folks out there who will tell you that you can appeal and would be happy to take the town's money and pursue that appeal. Um, so far, the courts that have had that come before them have all reje soundly rejected um, any appeal. Um, once the subsidizing agency issues that letter, it is, I don't wanna say final, but it is not appealable. So if we go to the next page, uh, so the application requirements. Um, we've already talked a little bit about, you know, the comprehensive permit regulations and making sure that the applicant complies with whatever your requirements happen to be. Um, every once in a while, I get a question from someone who will say, well, you know, we require um, 13 copies of the application and we require that the, the plans be provided to us in a certain format. And uh, you know, the applicant only provided us with five copies. And so we're gonna determine that that application is incomplete. I always caution against that because you're up against a clock, a short clock at that, where um, if you don't open the public hearing within 30 days, the applicant could come in and could assert uh, a constructive approval you never want somebody to get constructive approval of a 40B. Um, and you certainly don't want them to get constructive approval based on the fact that they didn't give us enough copies of their plan sets. You know, instead, if they haven't given you a complete application, still better off to go ahead, open the public hearing, and at, that, at the very outset, advise the applicant of all the ways in which that application is deficient. And you could then determine at that point, is the deficiency of such a, a magnitude that the board is of a mindset to just deny the application right then and there? Maybe it is. Or are they just little things that we say, okay, we're going to continue the public hearing because we're going to tell you we are not going to go ahead and we're not going to uh, get into the substance of this until you actually have satisfied our application requirements. Um, that, in my opinion, is a better way to proceed so that we avoid constructive approval. Um, that also includes, you know, payment of the filing fee. 
Um, there is a case out of Hanover where an applicant, uh, you know, challenged the amount of the filing fee. Um, in the end, the Housing Appeals Committee actually upheld the filing fee, even though the developer felt it was excessive. Um, and they are supposed to pay that filing fee in full. They can't say, we don't think that's an appropriate amount, so we're only going to give you a third of it, for example. Uh, we can deny an application based on their failure to satisfy all of the application requirements, and that would include the filing fee. So um, just something to be aware of if you ever get to a difficult developer. Ms. Um, just, oh, I just, just wanted to make mm -hmm. a note that um, a few years ago when we had an application for 132 Northampton Road, um, one of uh, KP Law's um, uh, uh, attorneys helped us to update our ZBA rules and regulations um, and particularly looked at the comprehensive permit portion of that. So, um, of course, Carolyn or um, Jonathan would like to review it too, but I just wanted to reassure the ZBA that that has been done relatively recently. Thank you. Good. Mr. Henry, I'm sorry I didn't uh, see your hand up. That's okay, Mr. Chair. I just want to clarify. So on a denial of a comprehensive permit, um, we're just denying the 40B. The developer can go back and try to um, correct their deficiencies and try to get their um, property developed, but they have to go through the different means of the permits and everything um, consistent with town bylaws? Or does a denial mean it's finite and that's a go away? So if you are, if you assert safe harbor and then you deny that comprehensive permit, that is the end of the road for the developer. So they, they either have to redesign this project and come back before the Zoning Board of Appeals in a way that they think the Zoning Board would actually approve the project. Or alternatively, they can then decide, well, maybe I'll try an open space residential or cluster subdivision. Maybe they will try some other means to develop the project that isn't a 40B. Those would, those would be their two alternatives. If you weren't in a safe harbor, and you denied the comprehensive permit, odds are they're going to appeal to the Housing Appeals Committee. And then we would ultimately, you know, see that process through, see whether or not the town prevails or the developer prevails. Um, I will say that um, the Housing Appeals Committee is heavily weighted in favor of developers. Um, so it's usually an uphill battle for a community uh, that denies a comprehensive permit. So that's why I think where you folks are sitting in a safe harbor position, absolutely assert it mm -hmm. and, and proceed to go ahead and hear these comprehensive permit applications so that there is no right of denial. I mean, no, no appeal of a denial for a developer. And out of curiosity, what was the Hanover fee? I forget off the top of my head, but it was at least five figures. Um, it, I have to say that when I when I read it, it did strike me as being a, a little bit high. But they, you know, had a, a you know a formula that went into it based on the number of units and acreage and blah blah blah. So they were able to justify it. Um, but it, it was one that struck me as being a little bit high in comparison to say some other communities I've seen. Okay. All right. So if we could continue with the next page, Rob. Okay, so um, we've already talked about waivers. So I, I don't want to belabor the point too much other than to make sure that at the time of application, the developer is supposed to submit um, a request of all waivers um, or, or identify what waivers they will be seeking. That might change in the course of your hearing. You know, it may very well be that some waivers come off the table because maybe they move a building a few feet 
one way or the other, and maybe they no longer need a setback waiver. Um, but it's up to the applicant to, at the time of application, to give you a list of all waivers that they will be seeking. And then right towards the very end, when you're getting close to that point where you're gonna close the public hearing and you're ready to deliberate, I always ask the applicant to submit a revised waiver list just in case you know, requirements were added or others were taken off the list in the course of the hearings, you wanna make sure that when you're finally voting to grant or deny waivers that you're working off of uh, the most up-to-date list. I just had uh, a town call me today about a 40B that was a small 40B. It was a Habitat for Humanity project uh, where no waivers had been requested. And they were in the process of, I guess, submitting their final uh, site plans to various town departments and they discovered, oops, they, there were a couple of waivers that they should have asked for. I said, well, you're gonna have to go back to the Zoning Board of Appeals and it's likely they're gonna find these to be a substantial change and we're gonna have to open the public hearing all over again. So, you know, if a developer doesn't update the waiver list at the time that the board is rendering a decision, uh, you know, the burden is not on the board to be keeping track of all the waivers. Um, so always make sure before, as you're getting to the end that you ask for that updated waiver list. Um, one other thing we didn't really touch upon as much, but um, when the application comes in, there's a requirement in the regulations that um, the applications be sent to various town departments. You know, you're, the, the ones that you would typically think of, you know, you're gonna want input from a water or sewer department. You're gonna want the Conservation Commission, the Board of Health to weigh in. Um, you might also want fire and police to take a look at the plans. Uh, that's one of the reasons why you wanna make sure you get enough copies at the outset so that you, you know the burden isn't on the town to be reproducing these plans, but you want to be able to reach out to all of the various town departments and boards to get as much feedback on the project as you possibly can. In all likelihood, they looked at the project once during the, the, the phase where um, the subsidizing agency was considering whether or not to issue a project eligibility letter. And it may very well be that there wasn't much that changed from the time that say, the Board of Health offered comments then versus this application. But you know, sometimes there are things, there are issues that get raised during the whole um, site approval process that an applicant will then address so that by the time they apply to the Zoning Board of Appeals, it might be slightly different. So you would want the Board of Health or whatever department to look at it again, to make sure um, they're either happy with the changes that have been made or um, if, they, if that raises any new concerns, they can deal with that as well. I think we can go to the next page because we already covered the other aspects there. Um, as far as the public hearing is concerned, it's no different from your typical public hearings under Chapter 40A, Section 11, with the exception of the fact that it has to open within 30 days. Um, it still notices to the same local, um, uh, sorry, what I was just talking about a moment ago about sending notices to local boards, you know, um, giving them a copy of the application that you're required to do within seven days of receipt of the application. Then, as we said, you open the public hearing within 30 days. You're supposed to close the public hearing within 180 days of when we open it. Um, those deadlines can be extended um, through a mutual agreement in writing with the, um, with the applicant. Um, so if for some reason, um, you should always keep your eye on when the date that the public hearing opens and what the 180 days happens to be, because some developers will run out the clock and they won't remind you of it deliberately. Um, and they won't necessarily say, gee, if the board doesn't vote on this uh, at their next meeting, um, you know, we're gonna be up against 180 days. They'll, they'll let that time just run. So it's always 
a good idea for us to keep our eye on that. Um, and if we need an extension to, to seek that from the applicant. Because um, the name of the game obviously is avoiding constructive approval. You don't want the applicant to say that their project is automatically approved just because we didn't do what we were supposed to do within the time frames. Um, and then the other thing that is and just one thing, Carol. I just want to make sure. clear that if we come up on one of these deadlines and um, the applicant does not want to extend the deadline and we're not ready, we can just deny it at that point. And we have the we have the power to deny it. And and if they really want to um, not agree to the uh, not to give us more time that we, we think we need, it's at their they're at a disadvantage in that case, correct? It, it is. Now, the only thing I would say to that is we've got to that if the if the developer, um, you know, is not going to grant any kind of an extension, then we have to close the public hearing within 180 days of the date that it's open. The board then has a 40 day window to deliberate from that 180 days. So we, you have a little bit of time to still talk about, okay, let, what, whatever it happens to be, let, let's suppose there was some kind of, a, um, you know, some stormwater data that the applicant didn't get to the board and um, as a result of that, the board wasn't willing to grant a waiver or the board didn't really feel that you had all of the data it needed to issue a decision within the 180 days. And then the applicant says, you folks have had long enough, I'm not giving you any more time. Well, I wouldn't just deny it based on the fact that you requested more time and it was denied. I would, I would suggest that we actually go into the board requested more time of the applicant because we had requested more data with respect to their stormwater uh, runoff calculations or whatever it happens to be. And despite the boards requesting this information or despite the fact that our bylaw requires that this information be provided to us, the applicant did not provide an update and likewise did not provide an extension of time for that update. So the board lacks the information that it needs to you know, be able to um, you know, grant this special permit. Beefing it up so that it isn't just about the time, we didn't have enough time. We have to have a predicate reason to do it. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, and then one other thing that is just a little bit different about 40 Bs from all of your other, um, applications that you'd hear is it's simply a majority vote of the board. Um, so sometimes folks kind of forget about that because we get caught up in the super majority world, but not in not when it comes to a 40 bay. So if we go ahead to the next slide, please, Rob. Thank you. Um, well, I mean, Rob, but I think Hilda has her hand. Oh, up. sorry. Thank you. Yeah, no, I was just going to ask, and it's not an important question, but can the applicant, if for some unforeseen reason somebody gets sick, who knows what, uh, they can't get the information in by the 180 days, can they ask to extend the time? Or is it they only the board that can extend the time? Uh, either party can ask to extend the time. Okay. And, um, I've never had a zoning board um, in a 40B context, I should say, I've never had a zoning board refuse to, to continue the 180 days. Um, I think just because there's too much at risk, yeah. um, they don't wanna have, to have their decision be flipped. I certainly have seen zoning boards you know, be, uh, get frustrated, shall we say, with some developers in, with respect to other projects and reach a point where they say, we are just not continuing this any longer. You've been stringing this out and stringing it out. Um, but I would always say that in a, with respect to a 40B, time can be your friend to really get the project right or to really show that we have given this developer every opportunity to provide the information. They haven't done so. Um, so I would always recommend that if the applicant's asking for a continuance, grant it. 
So going back to the, the public hearings, as we mentioned, you know, after the public hearing actually closes, um, you've got 40 days to render your decision. And then you have 14 days from whenever the date is that you vote to get that decision filed with the town clerk, just like you do with all of your other um, decisions. Um, one thing that I, I would also just say as a, a best practice is um, don't close that public hearing until you are absolutely certain that you've got all of the information that you need. Uh, we don't wanna be in a situation where we close the public hearing because maybe we're tired of hearing from the, the same elements uh, you know, week after week, and we feel we've heard everything that there is to be said. Um, if, if you think there's a possibility that there's some information that you still need to get from the applicant, don't close the public hearing. You, know, you can wait right up until the night that you're ready to vote to close the public hearing and vote as long as we've, we're within 180 days or as long as we have an extension. Um, I sometimes see with developers council that they will want to say work with, with me to draft the decision. And we might go back and forth a few times. So there might be an occasion in that situation where the board doesn't wanna close the public hearing yet because the board wants to hear, well, town council has proposed that the condition be worded this way. The developer is actually requesting that you do something a little bit differently. If you wanna hear from the developer, but their position, keep the public hearing open as long as you possibly can. If you feel you've got everything you need and you're comfortable closing the hearing, then by all means go right ahead and do so. So our next slide, please, Rob. Um, outside consultants, um, this is something that uh, really should be addressed at the outset of the public hearing. Um, as you know, just in your roles as a ZBA, we can pass the cost of any kind of third party consultant to peer review on to an applicant. Um, and they have to deposit whatever sum of money we set aside and uh, we get to select uh, consultants within various disciplines to help us analyze um, the project in it from a technical perspective. We can't unfortunately use this to uh, pay for legal services. So, uh, you know, I know I, that, that comes up from time to time of like, well, town council's been here at all of these years. Can't you pay for that? No, um, but I will say this, I can tell you that there is a community where a very well-known land use uh, attorney for a developer actually agreed to put it into a decision that they would make a certain contribution towards the cost of legal services. I don't know the context behind that. I can only say maybe there was something unusual that came up there and they, the developer figured, hey, it's easier to give them, you know, $25,000 or whatever it is towards town council and uh, get our approval than it is to fight over this. But that is highly unusual. That's all I can say. Um, I do recommend that at one of your very first hearings that there be a discussion about what peer review consultants you think are going to be necessary. So typically we look for a traffic uh, consultant. Typically it's civil engineering, stormwater. Maybe there's an architect uh, that we want to look at um, in terms of making some, some suggestions as, about like uh, massing or the design of the, the, the project. Um, I've even seen landscape architects brought in for a peer review. Uh, whatever those various disciplines are, you can get a peer review consultant for them one of two ways. Um, where, where Amherst has an awful lot of very capable professional staff available, sometimes staff will start this process rolling for the board before you open the public hearing. You know, for example, you might have a particular traffic engineering firm 
that um, might be under contract with the town to look at any projects that you might uh, that, that come before you. Um, if that's the case, staff could send the plans out to your traffic consultant before the public hearing begins. In some other communities, the board likes to do that themselves, or maybe they don't have staff, or they don't have um, consultants of this type that you know are say on call and available to them. So it'll it would be something that I would recommend you address at one of your very first um, sessions of the public hearing, because this is really going to set the table for all of your other meetings. Um, you know, the developer can challenge uh, our selection of a consultant only based on one of two reasons. Either they don't think the consultant has the qualifications necessary to review whatever that particular area of discipline is, or the consultant has a conflict of interest. So if you have this discussion publicly and you say, uh, we wanna hire Tetra Tech, to look at all of your civil engineering and to, to especially look at stormwater. Um, if Tetra Tech has done some work for the developer, they're gonna be conflicted out. Um, so that's always something to get out of the way at one of the first hearings. I also recommend, and I don't know if this is how the board has handled 40 Bs in the past, <laughs> but I always suggest that the board schedule their hearings topically. Yeah. So if you're, you know, whatever, whatever topic you want to begin with, usually the civil engineering and the, the stormwater, that usually um, takes a little bit more time. So that comes later in the process. But if you know that, for example, maybe the first night of real substantive hearings, maybe you want to discuss traffic. Well, if you tell everybody that at our very first meeting, we're going to discuss traffic. The applicant knows to show up with their traffic engineer. Our peer review consultant for traffic knows to show up. And the public knows that if their main objection or their main concern with this project happens to be traffic, that's the night to show up. Because you don't want, in my opinion, you don't want a hearing where this one's talking about traffic that one's talking about parking. This one's talking about screening. Somebody else is talking about um, density. Somebody else is talking about landscaping. And you feel like you're all over the place. And there may not be the right people present on a particular night. to. So that's something that we've done in the past, the last Absolutely. movie. Yep, we've done it the last time. And it makes a lot of sense. And it also, it speeds up the process. It speeds it up. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I like it too for the public because they know what night to show up to voice their concern on whatever it happens to be. So, um, you know, if you, if you're unrolling and assigning your peer review consultants at your first night, that's always usually a good time to like pull out the calendars and say, okay, when do we think we could be ready for the next public hearing and what topic do we think would be ready to address? And, um, I agree that it makes everything go much, much faster. So for the next slide, please, Rob. We also have a hand raised from- uh, Oh, Ms. sorry. Ms. Marshall. Yeah, are you saying that we can in fact limit public comment at the meeting? I didn't, I mean, we could encourage people to <laughs> express comments at certain meetings, but um, can we say, you know, you can't speak? Because no, I, I, I wouldn't say, I'm not suggesting that you can't let people speak. I. I what I typically see zoning board chairs, what they will do is they will say to folks, okay, so here's our calendar. Here are, you know, the next four meetings on this project. The first meeting will be traffic. The second meeting is going to be landscape and, and um, um, architectural design. The, the next one will be um, all the civil engineering, stormwater, all of that sort of thing. Um, and then you encourage people to show up those nights to voice their concerns if they're able and know that those are the nights when 
the applicants engineers or representatives and our engineers or representatives on that topic will be ready to address any any issues or answer questions especially if somebody says well why why can't we make this a right turn only or why can't we do this it'd really be nice to have the person present who can tell you why um, sure yeah, I, I understand. But if somebody says, look, I can't, you know, I can't make that yep. meeting. I've got to give my comments now. We that's fine. That That's fine, too. And you can say, OK, thank you very much. You know, All right. um, hopefully your schedule will change and you might be able to come back on that night. But um, or maybe you can watch it on Zoom. But yes, absolutely. You can't cut them off and say, nope, nope. Only discussing traffic tonight. Sorry, you'll have to come back another night. No. That you can't do, but like I said, it just, it, it helps things flow if we have a topic assigned. So then when it comes time to actually um, issuing your decision, um, as we said at the outset, you know, the standard is, well, reasonable, of course it's going to be reasonable and consistent with local needs. So this is where the, the board has to actually look at, you know, does the need for affordable housing outweigh any sort of valid, you know, we say a planning objective, but it could also be a zoning bylaw requirement or a regulation that relates to health, safety, open space, et cetera. So for example, if, if the board was inclined to look at a project and say, you know what, I, I, we're inclined to deny it because we just don't think there's sufficient open space. And we think that this is gonna be a problem. Um, the density is too much. You're gonna have kids living there. Kids need a place to go outside and play. Um, then you really have to cite some sort of requirement in the local bylaws that addresses open space and maybe a minimum open space requirement um, that somehow or other would justify the fact that this is what we require typically for a development of this size. The applicant is woefully deficient in meeting this. And, and we just don't think that, you know, granting a waiver is appropriate because we think folks are going to need open space to go out and recreate. Um, you always want to link your decision, if it is going to be a denial, to some sort of local requirement um, that we have applied to other projects, whether they're 40B projects or whether they are conventional market rate projects. Um, we've applied this, this standard in the past or that we've re required this minimum um, amount of open space in the past to other projects. We're gonna hold to it here and that becomes our basis for denial. The other way of looking at it is that the board recognizes, yes, we might have a local requirement that has a certain minimum amount of open space for recreation purposes. And yes, this project may not satisfy that local requirement, but we feel that the local and the regional need for affordable housing outweighs our strict application of that local requirement. So that's really the, the balancing test that, that comes into play. Um, the most, you know, if you're, if you're approving a comprehensive permit, um, you know, typically no one's looking at your decision quite as um, critically when it's an approval. It's when it is a denial that there's typically going to be an appeal. And that's when the Housing Appeals Committee is going to look at it and say, what was the local rule or the local bylaw that the board applied? And has the board imposed that same requirement on market rate projects you know, of a similar size? And if the answer to those questions is yes, we are, you know, we are steadfast in, this, in, in always applying this requirement, then you, know, feel, you can feel pretty confident going ahead and, uh, and applying it to a comprehensive permit project. But as I said at the, the outset, you can also waive every and any local rule that you see fit if you think that the need for affordable housing warrants it. So if we could go to the next slide, please. 
Um, I think I've already covered that in my comments that I just made. So if we can go to the next one. Um, I think we've also covered that as well. Um, so this is just sort of, you know, a couple of words of wisdom, but um, obviously where you're at the 10%, uh, you've exceeded the 10%, it isn't much of a problem. Um, you know, some communities fight 40 bees quite um, vociferously, shall we say. Um, and as we try to say, if you're not in a safe harbor situation, it's an uphill battle. Whether it's the 10%, whether it's the 1.5% general land area, if you're not sitting in a safe harbor and you go ahead and you deny a comprehensive permit, it better be based on a really good reason based on public health or safety because odds are um, your decision will likely be flipped. So as we try to say, make the best of it, you know, accept the fact that you might just have to comply with 10% if you're not at 10% yet um, and try to work with developers on projects that will help you get to the 10% or stay at the 10%. And consider appropriate mitigation in an approval of a decision that will help offset maybe some of the waivers that you've granted. Maybe there is a way uh, through mitigation to uh, soften the fact that we are not requiring strict compliance with our bylaws. So the next one. Um, so as far as conditions, um, First word of warning there is, you know, the board obviously, and this is going to be for an approval. Um, you can impose any conditions that are reasonable as you could with any other kind of application. The only thing is we have to be careful, first of all, um, the zoning board has to stay in its lane, so to speak. And the first thing we put down there is we can't invade the jurisdiction of the subsidizing agency. This I don't see as much anymore but when 40 bees were kind of uh, still new to us, um, there are some communities that would want to get into things such as, well, what is your rate of return on your investment? And we want to set a limit on, you know, how much money you can actually make from this project. The subsidizing agency has said, no, that is not for zoning boards to look at. That rests solely with the subsidizing agency. So my suggestion is don't even go there. You know, whatever, whatever subsidizing agency is providing the funding for the project, they have their own set of rules. They're going to make sure that the, uh, that the developer complies with those rules. There's no need for us to even um, get into it. And if we do, the developer is going to push back that we have now um, overstepped our authority. Um, we talked a little bit at the at the outset about uneconomic conditions, um, where uh, you know a developer could claim that a condition renders a project uneconomic. Um, we'd have to look at whether or not there's any way to mitigate against that, or whether we're going to hold firm and challenge the developer to say, "Well, prove to us that this renders the project uneconomic." Infrastructure concerns. I, I would have to say that the, the vast majority of conditions that I see zoning boards impose have to do with some kind of infrastructure, whether it is looking for the developer to um, add sidewalks, make a contribution maybe to um, a, a fund because the town is ultimately planning on um, redoing the, the main roadway that, that provides access to this development. Maybe there is um, some studying going on about traffic signalization. Um, maybe there's a project that's planned to um, improve water and sewer service. Any of those things, if we wanted to um, impose a condition that the developer makes some sort of reasonable contribution towards any of those projects, all of that is fair game. We just got to remember that cumulatively, 
the developer or even individually, the developer could argue, um, we can't comply with that. That would render it uneconomic. So going back a couple of slides ago where I was saying, don't close the public hearing until you're really, really sure that there's no further information to be gleaned. Um, you know, if the if if council or even someone on behalf of the, the board or staff is tasked with drafting the comprehensive permit and someone decides that, well, I think it would be great and I'll throw out a ridiculous amount. I think it would be great if we require them to make a million dollar contribution to our sidewalk fund. If the first time that the developer is seeing that is when you're in your deliberation phase and the public hearing has been closed, the developer is gonna let you know that they, uh, that they disagree and, and they think that that's an uneconomic condition, but there's no opportunity at that point to have the back and forth with the developer. So that's why I would say, keep the public hearing open as long as you possibly can, just in case in the context of working through the decision, you might be inclined to back down from a particular condition, or you might decide, you know, a million dollars is really too much. Maybe we just need $25,000. And the developer says, that I can live with. Um, you know, that's one of the reasons to, to, to not close the public hearing too quickly. Um, we talked earlier about- We have two questions. I sure. see Henry has a question, I have a question. I, I have a question on economic. So let's, we're in a safe harbor. We have, um, and we've done everything we're supposed to do to assert that. We say at one point, we're concerned about the runoff into some, into the streams near this, organ, near this uh, project. And so we are gonna require as a condition of approval that you comply with the Conservation Commission's um, regulations on A, B, and C. And they come back and say, we can't do that because that means we have to build back, we can't have enough units. Therefore, we can't do this project. Now, I, are you saying that we can't require them to comply with, in that instance, in that instance, we can't require them to comply with the, the ConComs regulations on water runoff because uh, they because of the need for housing is that the case no that's not what all i'm right. saying that's the beauty of of being in a safe harbor, safe harbor right? converting it, you know because again you can impose any conditions you want in your decision including we're not going to waive any of the provisions of the conservation commission stormwater regulations you've got to comply 100 percent and the developer because you've asserted safe harbor has no ability to appeal they can try to cajole and negotiate yeah. or do but whatever we the, yeah we <laughs> have the authority at that point because we're in a safe harbor exactly that's why i absolutely recommend assert the safe harbor go ahead still still carry out the public hearing to a decision but assert that safe harbor okay mr, so, mr. henry so staying in line with um economics and uneconomic uh -huh. um if if upon review of the um, the application to de determine the comprehensive permit, um, if the ZBA thinks that this project does not have sufficient um, low or moderate income housing, are we required to ask for them to increase the number um, to set it to approve this permit if we want to? So the um, percentage of affordability and typically the um, level of affordability. And when I say that, typically it's 25% of the number of units have to be um, uh, set aside as affordable. And typically it means affordable to someone uh, who is making 80% of your area median income based on uh, statistics that are kept by um, HUD down in Washington. Um, and those also are built into the subsidizing agency's requirements. So if we said, for example, um, I know you're providing 25% of the units, you're setting them aside as affordable, but we'd like to see 30%. 
you can ask. But if we were actually going to go ahead and impose a condition to that effect, um, I think we would be challenged by the developer on the fact that we are now getting into the jurisdiction of the subsidizing agency. Because if the subsidizing agency only requires 25%, our uh, additional 5% is going beyond that. Um, you know, same thing, like I, every once in a while we'll see, well, we want you to offer a couple of units that are also available to um, folks at say 60% of the area median income. So a deeper affordability level. You can ask. Um, but again, uh, usually the developers, when they have looked at this, they have figured out the math and they know that if they've got to do 25% of the units at 80% of the area median income, they know exactly how many market rate units they need to get to still realize the profit that the subsidizing agency limits them to. So I, I think that even though you're in a safe harbor situation, I think if you requested a deeper affordability or more units, I think what would happen is even though the developer could not appeal that decision, um, I don't think the developer would build the project. One other thing we have not talked about is uh, when we wanted to is, is a local preference that had come up in past times, and I want to get to that. And then yep. we'll build this. Um, I mean, Ms. Ms. Greenbaum's question. So let's sure. talk about local yep. preference. That has come up a lot, and I just and we and uh, there's I, I hear it all all the time from people in town wondering how how we deal with local <laughs> preference as opposed to you know in town versus regional. So speak to that. Sure. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. One, if we grant the 25% to people up to 80% of the area meeting, and can we can we also ask them if they might be willing to do another 20% for people to the 110%, for example, or that that would be one question. And another question, when you know they're building I don't want to get into too many details, but if there's a project where there's a seven acre parcel and room for a lot more uh, houses in the long run, and they're going to be run by a, a, a home ownership association, can the legal work for more units be done at the beginning? In other words, if they're asking for 20 units and you know that there's a need for many more than that. Can they plan for down the line if the ownership association wants to sell more lots to do that? Can they can they do that at the beginning? And and how, um, it's it's hard to explain without getting into specifics. But no, I I think um, so. So let me try. Um, so. Um, I think even requesting additional affordable units or changing the uh, the income eligibility for some of those units, uh, because you are in a safe harbor situation, you can ask. If you were not in a safe harbor situation, what I would suspect would happen is that the developer would immediately push back and say, we can't do more affordable units or we can't, uh, we can't do a, a greater level or, or different levels of affordability because one, they'll say we're complying with um, the- but we are in a safe harbor, but Carolyn, we are in a safe harbor, right? No, no, so, I, right, yeah, no, yeah. you are. Let's, so that's Let's just stay in that situation, in our situation, we are in a safe harbor, so- Yep. If, so what, so we can ask. You can ask. And we can, can we can impose that condition. And the you developer could, can say, I don't want any more part of it. And so then it's upon right. us to make the decision, do we want to lose the whole project or do we want to have this go on, right? Right. Okay. Okay, so the second, yeah, the second part of my question is, 
can we ask them to mark out the lots now? And then what would happen, say, in 50, if you have people with 30 year mortgages, they're not going to be moving out in a big hurry. And that's why the whole issue of, of local preference comes up. Does the, lo the local preference is no more, no longer in effect, say, when these people move, as, as with the rental housing? But they also may decide we want to invite our friends to live here, as happened with Pulpit Hill across the street from me. And then the, the friends are building up and down um, Pulpit Hill Road there. Can the lots already be in place so that down the line, 10, 15 years, the homeowners association can sell them? Can we ask them to do that? You can ask for anything you want whether or not they're going to uh, be willing to spend the time and the money uh, doing something uh, is, is entirely up to them. You know, they might say to you, look, we were, we've got plans for that additional acreage. Uh, we just don't know, uh, you know, it's nothing that is ready to be brought before the board. Or they might say, you know, we were planning on bringing that back. Uh, we were looking at these units now as say phase one, and we were hoping for uh, to come back at a later date with phase two. They might structure it that way. Um, but I, I think that if they came in, let's say with, you know, 10 units right now, and you still saw that there's plenty of acreage on the site that in all likelihood, there is room for more. Like anything you can ask, but I don't think that they're going to stop right then and there and say, okay, we'll, we'll plot this whole thing out or we'll show you what this looks like with 40 or 50 units because that's not part of their whole economic plan and it's also not part of the project that they submitted to their subsidizing agency for approval. So what happens so. in 15 years if, well, if the homeowners association wants to, and I'm assuming the homeowners association owns the land rather than the builder owning the land. But I mean, are these the kinds of things you can ask at a public hearing? It, it is all fair game. Yes, you can. And of course, you know, what someone's plan or what their answer might be when they're before you in 2023 may not be what comes back to you 15 years from now. Um, you know, things change, but but you can certainly ask. How does it how does it work with a homeowner association like this? Is the developer out of it once the units are built? Or, or is that something one asks? You can you can ask because it depends on whether or not, you know, if we were talking about rentals. Uh, no, home ownership. No, home I, ownership. I understand. I understand. Yeah. But there's also rentals where you would have yeah. a property manager. In a homeowners association, we'd ask for all the document built into your decision. We would say, you know, we want you to form a homeowners association and you need to incorporate the terms of this comprehensive permit into that homeowners association documents. And so with the homeowners association, is going to be that obligation that when an affordable unit is available for sale, they're gonna to have to reach out to the monitoring agent and they're gonna to have to figure out what is the resale value based on you know, where we are, how many years down the road it happens to be, what is the resale value calculated? And then they've also got to figure out, okay, now, what are our, what's our affirmative fair marketing plan say? You know, do we need to, um, you know, where do we, do we need to have a lottery? Do we need to advertise this? That's all something that, that's gonna be built into your regulatory agreement, the affordable housing deed restriction and your comprehensive permit. They're all gonna go hand in hand with that homeowners association. So I think, so we'll I think we're in the weeds on this one in, such, in a real hypothetical, um, th thing that's not really urgent for us to deal with tonight. We've only got a few more minutes and I really want to, I want to get to local preference. I want to have a discussion about that and, we, and it's five to nine. So I'd yep. like to talk about that right now, Caroline. And then sure. I'd like to go to Sarah Marshall's question. 
And I don't mean to cut you off, Hilda, but I, do, I, think it's, I think it's a hypothetical that we don't have to deal with tonight and that there's other, other things that are really important. Yeah, well, we'll get the answers when we need them, I'm sure. Yep, we will. Yep. So, so for local preferences, you absolutely can require local preferences. Um, typically, we'd say ask for whatever the maximum is allowed by the subsidizing agency, whatever program they're operating under. Um, right now, the local preferences tend to be um, 70 percent. I have not seen 100 um, percent. I've only seen 70 percent. Um, and that local preference would be for Amherst residents. It would be for people, it could be for people who um, work in the town. It could be for folks who have, um, you know, children in the school system. Um, but, it, but we can require a local preference and have a separate lottery built in um, for anybody that qualifies for the local preference. You could also have a veteran's preference if you felt that that was needed. <laughs> The, um, the only thing to bear in mind on the local preferences is that if we're going to push for more than 70%, for example, or uh, the, the subsidizing agency may sometimes ask for some kind of justification as to why the local preference is necessary. Um, you know, they might, for example, with Amherst, they could look at it, look at you and say, look, where you're nearly at 12% um, for affordable units, is there as great a need in Amherst for affordable housing as there might be, say, in a community that's hovering at 2%? Um, but you know, generally, I, I have not seen subsidizing agencies reject a local preference as long as it's still within that 70% range. Ms. Marshall. Yes, you have not defined local preference. I'm trying to figure it out, but could you, not all of us know what that is, at least I do. So, so a local preference would mean that there is going to be a requirement built into uh, the comprehensive permit that says so many, that, that says that, let's say, we'll take the 70% that is allowed for a local preference. 70% of the affordable units have to be set aside for residents of Amherst, employees of the town of Amherst, uh, veterans, uh, people who have children in the Amherst school system, whatever, whatever our categories are of who we want to give preference to. Sometimes it's just we want to give preference for local residents. Sometimes it's local residents plus town employees because we recognize that, hey, you could be a teacher just starting out and you qualify for affordable housing um, in terms of your, your income, that is. Um, you can build into the comprehensive permit that whether it is the initial um, leasing of, the, of rental units, if they're rental, or the initial sale of those, pro, um, of those home ownership units have to be offered to a lottery that would consist of people that, that qualify for that local preference. So there would be uh, an affirmative fair marketing plan. This is something that subsidizing agencies require um, that, that say who's gonna conduct the lottery, um, how, how the lottery is going to be advertised, how long uh, you know, a waiting list, for example, might be good for and you literally draw names from that lottery and you say, okay, here are, we've got 15 units. 70% um, of them can be set aside based on our local preference. And we just start drawing the names and we, we say, Susan Smith and Jim Jones, whoever it is, we go down the list and we offer them the affordable local preference units until we have the local preference units filled the remainder would go to say general population, all others. But the, the limiting factor is the subsidizing agency. If the, sub yeah. if the subsidizing agency sets a limit as to how many local preferences you can have, what percentage local preference you can impose, we, unless they waive it, we can't exceed that. Is that right? Correct. 
Correct. There's 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 a limit there that we we just can't make a number up. We have to right. we have to rely upon or base it upon the, the subsidizing agency's guidelines or Correct. their waiver. Got it. Yes. Okay. So I think with that, um, we're basically at the end. Um, I can talk a little bit about appeals, but I'm also mindful of the fact that uh, we're, we're approaching nine o'clock. So if anybody had any other questions. Uh, we really, as a safe, with the safe harbor, we have very limited appeals. There's very limited risk of appeal. Just speak to what that, what is the risk of appeal if you're in a safe harbor? Uh, well, if you're in a safe harbor, they, there there is no opportunity for the developer to appeal. That right. doesn't mean that, so now sometimes what we have are abutters, neighbors who are opposed to a project. Yeah. Um, they can appeal, but they, they don't go to the Housing Appeals Committee. Their appeal goes to Superior Court or Land Court. Yeah. Either way, you know, it's it's an appeal that has to be filed within 20 days. And well, of course, I, I, you know, I wanted to see if there's any other general questions that people have before we close. Um, you're pretty much done with your presentation, are you not? I, I am. I had yeah. one slide oh. on modifications, but um, I think we did cover that a little bit earlier. So I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. So if people have questions, this is the time to do it. General questions. Uh, Ms. Greenbaum. Okay, I'm still pushing my thing issue has anybody ever appealed to the subsidizing agency to ask for more than 70 percent can we try asking for 100 percent local preference because we have the need and we're supplying housing for all the little towns around us who aren't up to 70 aren't up to 10 percent in fact they're way below and we're supplying housing for them where our people don't have a place to live and so is it possible? Has anybody ever done it? And I understand that, that, that there are other people in the town who are asking the same question of our legislators, because I brought it up and they said, well, we're already working on this. So, so where, where, do, where do people stand at this point with regard to 100% local preference? Does anybody know, Chris? I... Yeah, Chris, come on. May I? Um, so I have heard people talking about moving in the other direction that um, if you insist on local preference or if you insist on a large amount of local preference that that puts at a disadvantage people of um, BIPOC community because we don't have a very high percentage of BIPOC community here. And so it would um, tend to exclude them if we said you know, all of the people, uh, all of the units had to be um, local preference because it would tend to, you know, match the um, de de demographic makeup of our town. So in some in some people's minds, it's considered a kind of racist um, effort. And so I think that that's something that we need to consider. And we've heard that from um, the, the uh, affordable housing developers, um, and we've heard it from DHCD, which is now this other thing, which I can't remember. But um, in any event, that is an issue that is brought up. So then to try to push that number of 70 to an even higher number, I think you would hear an even stronger argument against that for that reason. Because I'm hearing it from the BIPOC community that they can't afford to live here. Some of the ones that are running for town council now are saying they can't, they can't afford to buy a house. And their BIPOC community. So, but well, may I say right one? Here. May I say oh. one more thing, which yes. is that um, often what happens, and Nate has explained this to me. Unfortunately, Nate couldn't be here because he had to go to two other meetings tonight. But um, what happens is that there's this long uh, list of people who apply for these units. And then they have to qualify and qualifying can be very challenging. They have to be able to show a certain amount of money in the bank. They have to be able to show that they can pay the first month's rent and the last month's rent and 
maybe a security deposit. So all of a sudden you're looking at, you know, thousands of dollars that they have to have available to them in order to be considered to go into one of these units. So you wouldn't think that that would be necessarily a requirement for affordable units, but it is. They're treated the same way as the people who are going into the market rate units. And so it makes it harder for low-income people to even qualify. So so anyway, that is that is an issue. And that may be, well, I won't go any farther than that. that, that those are the things we'll have to discuss in, in context of the actual application or the, of the 40B application before us. So, yeah. And so, Caroline, the one thing I would just answer Hilda's question, which was, has anybody been successful in appealing whatever limit the subsidizing agency had on local preference that you know of? I'm not aware of anyone requesting greater than 7% local preference. That doesn't mean there haven't been some communities that have tried, yeah. um, but, you know, it isn't, it isn't a legal proceeding. It would be more of a, you know, a, a, an appeal made to the subsidizing agency and whatever response they give. Um, but I have not seen any projects permitted with a, with greater than 70% local preference. All right. Mr. White, you had your hand up earlier and you took it down. Um, I don't, if you have that question, go ahead. I'm good. My question was, right. my question was regarding uh, percentages to AMI and you answered it. So thank you. All right. Other questions? Just, just a follow up to what Chris was saying. Um, and that was a very good point, this being affordable housing and for people to qualify first, last security, does 40B allow us to set conditions where some of those criteria is waived? No, that starts to get into um, the jurisdiction of the subsidizing agency because the subsidizing agency is literally going to be the 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 entity that is going to provide funding to the developer to make this project possible. So everything having to do with how you calculate um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the sale price of the affordable units, what uh, the retail, what the resale value is five, 10, 15 years from now, all of that, that's all determined um, by the subsidizing agency. And we can't, correct me if I'm wrong, we cannot uh, impose conditions that are contrary to the subsidizing, that are in the subsidizing agency's jurisdiction. Correct. We provide the money to subsidize based on certain uh, lease provisions or resale provisions or whatever else, right? Correct. I mean, you can certainly require that any lease or, or uh, mortgage or anything like that all has to incorporate the terms of this comprehensive permit. Um, and let's suppose there's, you know, a, a requirement that, you know, every unit has to have a dedicated parking space, for example. Okay, that is still within the zoning board's de uh, determination. But starting to get into the financing of the project uh, and how much rental properties happen to be or resale values or how much of a down payment someone has to, to be able to come up with, that is not within the ZBA's purview. That is the subsidizing agency. And then one last, this, I, you know, I, I said I didn't want to go on hypotheticals, but I'm going to do it myself and I apologize to everybody. So what if the town of Amherst decided to subsidize two units out of uh, a 50 unit um, development and the rest of the subsidization was done by a, by a, a state agency? Could they have their own, um, for those two units, could they have their own um, lease of requirements at first, last, and, so, and uh, um, um, damage deposit? Could they have something different than the subsidizing agency because those two units are being subsidized by the town of Amherst? I, I think in a purely hypothetical manner, yeah. I think you could. Um, yeah. You know, my head is, is starting to explode with things like, well, but then there are procurement issues and there's that this and that. So, sense. you know, putting all of that stuff aside, let's suppose you had an affordable housing trust who, um, you know, was 
buying, selling properties or was over, you know, acting as um, a monitoring agent for a couple of rental properties. They could relax those standards so in their yet. There may be creative ways we can deal with this real problem, um, but I don't know. I don't know how it applies to anything we're going to be looking at in the next two applications, but those are real issues, real issues. Yep. Other questions, comments. So I think you can see why this was the, the 40 B's are a little different than our <laughs> real different than our normal um, special permit applications or our variances. And it's, it's a more complicated process. It gives a lot of flexibility to us, a lot of responsibility that we have to have to reach out to all the other commissions and boards in town to make sure that we gather opinions and their input and their advice to us because we can. it all comes down to us to make these decisions. The staff does a really good job of, of reaching out and in the past I know they've done that and, that's, and we get this information back from the boards. It's really helpful. But um, this is a, I think this really was helpful, Ms. Murray. This is important for us to, to understand this and we look forward to um, being able to call upon KP, you and KP Law to help us get through this uh, over the next you know, six, eight months when we have a couple of these uh, 40 Bs that come up. So thank happy, you. Happy to help, Mr. Chairman. And thank you very much for having me tonight. And, and just... One one follow up question to to um, Steve's point that this process is a little bit more complicated. So, is it un, is it unprecedented to say okay, this is a lot of information, a lot of documentation. We have to consult with many departments. Let's just agree on the outset to extend the time of the bat rather than just sticking with the one hundred eighty days. You could try that. Um, but, um, you know, a developer likely right off the bat would push back on that saying, look, this is supposed to be a one-stop comprehensive permit process. And yes, we realize there are a lot of issues that need to be addressed, but the legislature in its wisdom <laughs> has decided you open the public hearing within 30 days, you should be able to close it with a, within 180. I can tell you I've had 40B hearings that have spanned two years. Did they need to span two years? Probably not. You know, there were lots of reasons and hiccups along the way. Um, but I could see a developer right at the outset saying, I don't want to agree on night one that I'm going to a, a you know, extend the 180 days. Let's see where we are on, on you know, day 90 or day 120. And if, if the board feels that because information is getting to them slower or uh, we're having more difficulty getting our engineers to prioritize um, and turn, you know, turn things around in a quick enough fashion for you, let, let's revisit it then. But on night one, they might think um, that we're just looking for an excuse to drag our, our heels. One thing I would say, Mr. Henry, is that we're fairly lucky here in town, and at least in my experience, is that these, the developers that's come, that have come before us, because they have to do an eligibility letter, because they have to start to line up the subsidization, because they have to they talk with the staff of not only the planning department, but of the other departments. They have a lot of this information already that they're trying to pull together and the staff in the town is already aware of the concerns that could be raised. So it's not like this gets dropped without any kind of, you know, um, preceding work done to sort of pave the way to the, the when we start our first hearing. But I, I also know that in the past, our time has gone on longer than 180 days. Um, when we've done this, uh, this uh, 40 Bs. And so, and developers have been open to that because it worked out for a better, in that case, it just worked out to have a better project and everybody agreed to it. So, but Chris, you, you have dealt with this in the past. You see that the developers 
kind of know what, what, what's expected and what we have, to, and they have resolved a lot of these, or at least addressed a lot of these issues, right when they start and produce their application, correct? Yes, they've gone through a lot of process with the town staff, the um, engineers and the planners and the building commissioner um, to get to the point where they're going to submit um, an application. So they really are, you know, they have refined their proposal to, to a good degree. And I think, you know, when it comes to you, that it'll be a, a generally speaking, a pretty solid proposal. You've got better things to do, I think it looks like, uh, Mr. Henry. It's nighttime. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Oh, thank you for uh, taking the time. All right. Are there any other questions? If not, oh, Mr. Meadows, you're muted. Yep. You're muted. Do we have a sense of when these projects are coming forward, date wise? Uh, so we're anticipating the first one, which is ball lane to be submitted within the next couple weeks. Um, and we're most likely not going to see it come before the zoning board until October. Um, that's, that's what we're looking at right now. Um, and the other project that Chris had mentioned, we haven't really heard about at all. Uh, the Wayfires project, I believe that's what it was, right, Chris? Yeah, but we're expecting that that's going to be delayed. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there's no other questions about this, thank you, Ms. Murray, for, for uh, the presentation. The next order of business is uh, public comment on any matter not before the board tonight. Uh, if you wish to comment, raise your hand. Uh, I'd so indicate by raising your hand. I see no public attendees, so I can't believe that there's any public comment. There's none, all right. Now, there is business not anticipated within the last uh, 48 hours. Is there any, the only thing I can think of that we should review is what the next upcoming meetings are. And Rob, can you just run through that with us? Absolutely. And I'll be quick because um, I know it's late. Uh, so the next meeting we have is August 24th. We have a, a large solar project that's going to be uh, having its first public hearing date. Um, and then we have September 14th which uh, we just had two permits recently filed for um, yesterday. Uh, one of them is for a converted dwelling and the other one is for um, modifying an existing apartment in a mixed use building. And uh, we also have the 485 Pine Street folks coming back for a uh, discussion with the board at public meeting regarding their landscaping plan and uh, their parking layout. Um, and then on the 28th of September, which is the last day I have in mind for scheduling, um, we have 798 800 North Pleasant Street um, public hearing continued, which is a proposed duplex on a, a lot with an existing duplex. And those are the next three meetings. And that's all I have scheduled for the time being. Okay. All right. Any other old business? Any other new business? Excuse me. If not, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Do I have a motion? Mr. Meadows moves. Is there a second? Second. Second. Mr. Henry seconds. This is not debatable. If it requires a roll call vote, chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Motion passes. We are adjourned. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. We'll see yep. you all um, in a month. I won't see you next week or in two weeks. I'll see you in a month. Thank you. Good night, Bye. everybody. Good night. Bye.